All right, good morning, family. Good morning. All right, it's raining. It's raining hard out there. Uh, I bet you wish you were in here. There's room right here. Yeah, look, by the <laughs> you get baptized today. <laughs> All right, so the title of my lesson this morning is The Strength of the Church. The strength of the Church. You read it from the book of Acts in chapter 15. You can turn there if you want. And uh, yeah, there's room up here. If anybody wants to come in, there's room over here by the cooler. Up front, you can sit in my seat if you want. You don't have to get wet. Yeah, got any room up front? Come on in. No shame. No shame. No scare them. Go get them. So we're in, a, we're in Acts chapter 15 here. So leading up, leading up to Acts chapter 15, where they're at right here, in uh, Acts 13, about 15 years into the first century church, right around 46 or 48 AD. So the church is about 15 years old leading up to this. Paul and Barnabas are sent out from the church in a place called Antioch, which is modern day Syria. And it's known as Paul's first missionary journey. Their mission was to evangelize and plant churches throughout Galatia, Galatia which is modern day Turkey nearby. So they had a nice big church in Antioch and they're spreading out. Growing numerically and spreading geographically. Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations. That's exactly what they were doing. By the end of Acts 14, they came back to Antioch to report to the church there the amazing things that God had been doing through him, through them, and how they had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. For the most part, the Christian church was Jewish converts to Christianity, but now they were sharing their faith with. Other people in the area, the pagans, uh, the idolaters, or whatever you want to call them, uh, a lot of Greek people and philosophers and all kinds of people were trying to becoming converted to Christianity. And so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Now, the church, as it was growing, of course, uh, you know, experiencing what we would call growing pains. I know my daughter, Rachel, when she was a baby, she'd wake up at night crying and her legs were hurting. Why? Because she was growing her bones. We're stretching out, and that hurts. Yeah. You have growing pains, right? Yeah. There's an old Irish proverb. I'm going to have a whole bunch of Irish proverbs. I hope you guys have got any Irish in the house here. Anybody? Oh, wow. There's a couple. A couple like, oh, should I say that I'm Irish? I, yeah, man. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Levi's in the back asking his mom, am I Irish? <laughs> I can tell you, like, oh, do I? <laughs> <laughs> You're my brother, so you're Irish. You're welcome. <laughs> and so uh, there's an Irish proverb that says, when a twig hardens, it's difficult to twist. Every beginning is weak, right? So a twig will start off and we can twist it, but as it gets hardened and strengthened, you can't twist it, right? Kind of cool. When we grow, we mature, but with growth comes growing pains. And when there's pain, attitude can start to come in, right? disagreements start to happen, right? And our worldliness can get in the way of God's plans. And it can delay them because we're human and that's what we do. We disagree with each other, right? But God allows these things to happen for a reason so that we can learn, so we can become strong and make it through the next storm even better, yeah. amen? amen? So in this lesson, we're gonna have some cool practicals as our church grows that can help us in our marriages, that help us in our relationships with each other. We'll also talk about our hearts and the desires of our hearts and, and, and how that affects our behavior. And we'll have some cool things that we can go out and do to help our fan, our friends, our family, and our neighbors to know Jesus. So right now, we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 15. Now, this is about 49 or 50 AD or so. <clears throat> A little trouble breaking out here in the growing church. Come on, bro. Preach. And you're, you might be wondering, is there trouble in our little church that you're making this lesson? No, no, I don't think so. I'm just making the lesson. It's good. But number one, it takes strength to admit that you don't know. Acts chapter 15, verse one. We as guys, we don't like to admit when we're, we don't know something. It's like, yeah, do you know this thing or that thing? You know, you know, uh, you know about the carburetor and a 67 Chevy? Oh, yeah. 
Hang on, I gotta do this text. Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> no, I bought it. <laughs> Just rebuild that thing. Okay. Must be a wrench. Now, chapter 15, verse 1. <clears throat> Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So we got this church as it's growing and you got diff different people with different backgrounds in the church, right? So they have these religious people these are uh, Jews that converted to Christianity, and they're trying to bring some of the Old Testament laws into the New Testament church, into the Christian church here. And it's causing a problem. Paul and Barnabas were converting all these Gentiles. Now, the Jews, when they were born, when they were a baby, they would get circumcised, as was according to the law of Moses, right? And now these, these people that were not raised Jewish were not circumcised. They're saying, these guys that are calling themselves Christians and they're adult men, they need to get circumcised to prove that they're following the law of Moses. And the guys are like, hold up. Just hold up. I think you might need to get some advice on this one, pal. That's a, that, I did not sign up for that. That's a lot. You're asking a lot here. I didn't sign up for that, right? <laughs> and so they send these guys, Paul and Barnabas, down to Jerusalem to talk to the church leaders to get some advice on this this, this, this disagreement that they were having, that creates some help with this disagreement. And we all have disagreements and it's good to get help, right? Yeah. And so, you know, this, this, this trip is 300 miles. <laughs> it took about two weeks to get there. And so it's a big decision to go someplace like that and to get advice. It's funny, Beth and I, uh, we were asked in 2014, we were asked to move to Kona from Honolulu to lead a little church over there, a little Bible study group that was a part of the Hilo church, right? They asked us to do it. And that was a big thing. Like I had a good, I, I had a good job. Beth had a good job too. Like I was a, I was a judging bodyboarding contest. And they're like telling me they're gonna send me around the world to go traveling and judge all these bodyboarding contests. I, um, I had my own uh, fishing business, my own company catching fish, you know, and, and we're doing pretty good. Beth had a great job. She just finished college, she got, got tenured as a school teacher. So like, they're like, can you go to Kona and just kind of wing it out there? You know what I mean? And survive. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Ooh, that's a big cost. And I, yeah. so I, you know what I, I do? I get some advice. I, I make sure I make some phone calls on different people. Like, this is a good idea. Should we do this? You know, I, I talked to my boss and he like, he offered to double my salary if I'll stay, you know, and I can travel around the world, get paid to go to these exotic places in, in the Canary Islands and Tahiti and Fiji. Uh, Brazil, all over the world, Peru, everywhere, Australia, even. And I was like, "Wow, that's 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 a lot." You guys are asking a lot here, but I, but this is like my passion in my life up until that time, and even now, of course, is to help people become Christians, to evangelize the world. And I'm looking around in our church and in Honolulu, and it, you know, was, things were not going that great there. Not not too many people were in a position where they'd be able to do something like that and survive it out here in Kona, right? And so. So I got a bunch of advice and Beth and I were talking about it. And so I come home one night, uh, like two nights after we were asked, I think it was. And I, I told, I, had, I grabbed my phone and I just typed out a text message on it. <laughs> and I'm like holding my finger like that, Beth. And she's like, holding laundry. Yes. Like, I'm serious, you know, do you love me? And she's like, yes. Do you trust me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Send. <laughs> what did you just do? <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> you want <welcome. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So here we are. <laughs> it's always good to get advice, though. It's what keeps the church strong. I didn't just make an emotional decision. I thought about it, prayed about it, got some advice. And of course, we didn't just come and 
like be homeless on the beach in a tent or something like that. You know, we're like, okay, we have to find a job first, then we'll go. Find a place to live first, then we'll go. And we did. And God's taking care of us and blessed us abundantly. And now we have a church in Kona. It's amazing, right? You know, um, I'm going to go through a couple of Proverbs about taking advice. And I think a lot of us can make decisions in our life without getting advice. And we wind up suffering consequences of bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a great idea. We go do it and we get slammed, right? So I'm here to help you not get slammed. You're welcome. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of the fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 11, 14. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Proverbs 13, 10. Pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found on those who take advice. Proverbs 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. Proverbs 24, 6. For waging war, you need guidance, and for victory, many advisors. Proverbs 27, verse 9. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and pleasantness of one's friends bring friends springs from his eternal counsel. Proverbs 15, 31. He who listens to a life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. It is good to get advice on making decisions. It's even more important when having a disagreement. Hi. Fortunately, Beth and I didn't have a disagreement on moving to Kona and then once again, moving here to Hilo. We agreed it was a good idea. We did it and God has blessed us, but we had lots of advice. But guess what? We disagree sometimes. We have disagreements. I'm usually right. I'm just throwing that out there in the beginning. <laughs> I'm kidding. I always put the first instinct. Right? <laughs> but we have disagreements, right? It's not wrong or bad to have disagreements, but there's a way to go about it with, uh, without being unspiritual about it. Amen. And that's what really helps us. And being a part of a strong church means we get to ask for advice on our disagreements. And that's what helps us get even stronger as we grow. So there's some cool practicals I want to go through with you guys. That Beth and I were given this advice in our marriage counseling. And now, of course, this can, even if you're not married, this can go with the, in the brother's household, the sister's household, or just disagreements you may have with another disciple. This is very helpful advice, right? No talking over the other person and escalating in the volume or interrupting someone. It's prideful to think that what you have to say is more important than what the other person has to say. And that's why people raise their voice and talk over other people. They're being prideful and they think, I have something more important to say to you, I'm gonna loud. I'm gonna get loud, I'm gonna yell. Right? And they get, it escalates and it gets worse and worse. It's just prideful. <clears throat> Don't, uh, no word hogging or going down all the mongoose trails into the weeds, into the wilderness, you know? <laughs> No lecturing, no blabbing and going off topic. Not allowing the other person to have a say uh, is rude. And the Bible says, love is not rude. No derogatory comments or condescending remarks or name calling. The Bible says to only say what's useful for building others up and encouraging them, right? No bringing up past disagreements, fights for wrongdoings, stick to the relevant disagreement. The Bible says love holds no records of wrong. Married couples, for the married couples, the D word, divorce, is a swear word. View that as a cuss word. You don't ever say it. Don't bring him up. Don't ever bring it up. Quitting is never an option in a Christian marriage, even when sharp disagreements arise. Is view the D word as you would the F word, something you would never say or consider saying. So the heart of the disciples here in this passage were awesome. They said we can have a disagreement here, but we're not going to give up on each other. And we as Christians can never give up on each other. And we get help to be unified with each other. And sometimes you just don't know. You know, sometimes you just don't know that you're wrong. It, it might seem like you're right. You might sincerely believe that you're right, but that doesn't mean you're right. It just doesn't mean it at all. It's not wrong to not know. What's wrong is to not know that you don't know. <laughs> the Irish proverb, one more time. 
May the best days of your past be the worst days of your future. Don't hold on to stuff in the past. Always move forward. My challenge is if you're in a disagreement with anybody right now, get some advice about it. Desire to be unified rather than desire to be right. Point number two, a pure heart is a strong heart. Yeah. Acts chapter 15. Continuing our reading in verse six. <clears throat> the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our forefathers have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. So here we have this disagreement that's happening, right? The Jewish converts were having issues with the pagan converts, the Greeks mostly. And they, uh, they wanted them to prove that they were saved. And so Paul here is describing to them something that happened in Acts chapter 2 and something that, uh, that happened in Acts chapter 10, where the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 was poured out upon the Gentiles and at the day of Pentecost. And they started speaking in different languages so that other people could understand them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, the power of occurrence. Then again, in Acts chapter 10, the same exact thing happened to the Gentiles as they were being converted, proving that God is accepting all people and not just Jews. And the Jews rising up in the church were having an issue with this, and they wanted them to prove something here. The Bible here is saying that God purified their hearts here because of their faith. They had faith, and God accepted them because of their faith. God gave them a pure and a strong heart filled with faith. So what does that look like exactly? Turn to Ezekiel chapter 11. One of my favorite passages. Because the reality is, family, we can all at times tend to be and even get hard-hearted. Yeah. Acts chapter, or Ezekiel chapter 11. <clears throat> In verse 6, the Bible says, Oh, sorry, Ezekiel 11, verse 19. There we are. That's the one. <clears throat> Bible here says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I'll remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But, for, but as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. Wow, this is hectic. An undivided heart. So the Bible here is explaining, God is explaining something here. He said he wants to give us an undivided heart. Heart. What is a divided heart? Well, according to this passage, a divided heart is someone who has one part of their heart devoted to God, but another part of their heart divided to something else, right? Idols, idolatry. And we can idolize anything these days, can't we? We can idolize our opinions, idolize our emotions. We can idolize our jobs, our money, whatever. Whatever we do, we're not giving our heart fully to God. Because you have a divided heart. And a divided heart is a hard heart. And God says, I want to remove that heart and give you a heart transplant and give you a whole new heart. And, and uh, I, think, I think really looking at this and looking at how society has conditioned us these days. And, it, and it's been doing that for thousands of years. And really what it is is Satan. Satan is always trying to get a piece of our heart. Just a little small piece of our heart. Yeah. If we don't have a pure heart, 
we don't have a strong heart, our heart is prey for Satan. He's always trying to do that, distract us. Fear, fear is a big one these days. Fear, he gets us to live in fear and make decisions based on fear. And he can get a part of our heart, get idolized even fear. A divided heart, a, a, an undivided heart fully trusts God and is completely and totally committed to him and trust him in all things. You know, when wolves stalk their prey in North America, one of their primary food sources are deer. The wolves love to go and hunt deer. The wolves don't get an, a, a, a kill from an unlucky deer. It's not an unlucky deer. They get a, a kill from a sick deer, a weak deer, or a very young deer. That's the deer they go after. They don't want to try to must mess with the bull deer with the horns. <laughs> you know what I mean? They'll get jacked up. They can get hurt really bad. They get injured and they'll, they'll die. You, you, can't, you can't have an injured wolf. The other wolves will kill it. They know that, right? And so anyway, so they don't, that, Satan's like that. He's not looking for strong-hearted, pure-hearted disciples. He's like, that's too much work. And I mean, he'll, look, he'll wait for his opportunity. If your heart is fully committed to God and you're strong, you don't have to worry about Satan. You're close to God, you don't have to worry about it. But when we're not, when we're divided, we have a divided heart, Satan will take us out. That's, he's, that's what he's looking for. All he needs is a little piece. He doesn't even need half your heart. All he needs is about 1% of your heart. That's all he needs to divide you away from God. Because God wants your whole heart, not 99% of your heart. We need to have a pure and strong and faithful heart so Satan won't take us out. We need to have thick skin and a soft heart. Amen. We're not easily offended by stuff that happens to us. Because stuff's going to happen to us in our marriages. Stuff is going to happen to us in our relationship with each other. Stuff's going to happen to us. We're going to get hurt by the world. It's going to happen, but we got to have thick skin and a soft heart. We need to be not easily offended while being incredibly and extremely loving and compassionate and gentle and kind. And that's challenging. It's challenging because what happens when someone hurts you, right? You put up walls and you get thick, thicker skin on your heart. We only can do it with God, though. That's the only way we can do it. What does that look like lived out, right? Having an awesome, radical, quiet time. We talked about it in our our campus devotional. Like you look at Paul and the stuff that he went through. Like you can imagine his quiet times in the morning, what they must have looked like. It's like every day he lived his day like it was his last day on earth. Every single day. He must have had the most amazing, like read the scriptures and just pray and cry out to God. Please God, help me be the most awesome disciple in the world, even though I know I'm the worst and the lowest of them all. And he accomplished great things for God because of that. That's how he did it. That's that's how he kept it. He had to have the craziest quiet times ever. Radical quiet times. See, back in the Old Testament, which was the disagreement here, righteousness is obtained by keeping the law and circumcision was part of the law. And, and Paul, the, the argument here Paul is making is that the, the Jews would, couldn't even keep this law. They weren't even able to do it. It was too hard for them. Why are you trying to make it hard for these guys now? We couldn't even do this. Their hearts were, they were unable because their hearts were hard and because they're rebellious. You look through the Old Testament, rebellion. That's all you would see, rebelling yeah. against God's commands yeah. and idolizing. Going after the people around them and their idols. That's what they did. Rather than pure and strong, their hearts were weak and sickly. So Jesus had to come. And now today we are saved, not by observing the law but by faith. And when we have faith, we can repent and we can get baptized. Right. Oh, no. Observing the law and circumcision no longer have any value. The Judaizers were trying to say Gentile converts needed to obey the law and circumcision was proof of that when actually God giving them the Holy Spirit was the proof. Paul is saying faith in God purifies our hearts and God's grace saves us. Yeah. So all this Old, Old Testament and New Testament stuff might be a bit confusing. So let me simplify it a little bit. Come on, dude. Stop, go. <clears throat> Today, if you have a pure heart, strong heart combined with faith, you will be strong enough to do every, anything and everything that the Bible challenges you to do. Without faith, you can't do it. It's too hard. Imagine this, right? Like this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to tell these guys that they need to get circumcised. Imagine that for the guys, right? 
like you, you want to become a Christian and tell you got, oh yeah, and uh, by the way, to be a part of this church, you gotta get circumcised. Are you circumcised? You know, like, <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and these guys are already in the church. They're like already Christians. They're like tithing. They're giving their money to singing. They're, they're praying. All of a sudden, these other guys come in. Hang on, hang on. Which one of you are not circumcised? Like, <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. I did not sign up for this. No, 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 no. Let's talk about this, you know. <laughs> Imagine that. Like, I don't know, this day and age, you know, I think the church might be only women. I don't know. Like, if that was the case, if we had to get circumcised to come in, you know. <laughs> but it's it's awesome. That's not what God's asking. Like God's saying, you don't have to get circumcised to be a Christian, guys. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> you know. All God wants is all of our heart. And when we give all of our heart to them, to him, it's no big deal, right? But people have a hard time giving all of their heart to God. That's what the issue is. A lot of people can give our church a hard time. We get this rep, right? Oh, all, they, all they care about is baptism. You got to get baptized, you know? And people say, oh, that's a, you know, that's a work. And you're, you're saved. You're not saved by works. You don't need to get baptized. The Bible commands it, period. And people that get hung up on baptism, a lot of times you think, man, I'm having a hard time convincing this person that I'm hoping to convert to get baptized because they said they already got baptized when they were a baby or something like that. Or I, I don't need to get baptized. It's not a command and it's a suggestion or whatever. And they have all these excuses and we think baptism is the issue. Baptism is not the issue. Baptism is easy. Yeah. That might be the easiest of the things. You do have to have faith. You do have to repent and you have to be baptized to be saved according to the Bible. Now, baptism is the easiest of those. Yeah. Faith is like a challenging. Faith is a bit challenging, right? It is. Like faith in this book written thousands of years ago about this dude named Jesus that probably walked around back then and maybe is a fictional character, some kind of lunatic. I don't know, you know. Have faith is give my life completely to this and, and make the word of God the standard of my life. Doing that, well, it's, that's challenging. But the, 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 cha the most challenging one of them all, repent. Yeah. And prove your repentance by your deeds. Oh. People start finding about that. They're, they're like, oh, they're like <laughs> baptism, yeah, I can't do that. You know, <laughs> what? Yeah. It's never baptism. It's always repentance. Yeah. To get someone to repentance, they must have great faith, yeah. though. And so when we're helping people become Christians, what do we do? We read the Bible to them and we build their faith up. Yeah. When they build their faith up, they can have a strong and pure heart. And repentance and baptism come quite easily. It's no big deal. So it's always a faith issue, a repentance issue before it's a baptism issue. And you got to have a strong heart. You got to have a pure heart. And you got to have an undivided heart. If your heart's divided, you'll never make it. When we have an undivided, strong and pure heart we can truly serve god in powerful ways just like paul and barnabas did they evangelized the known world in their lifetime without cell phones without the internet without without a bible on their cell phone they had scrolls and their testimony and these great miraculous gifts that god gave them that's how they did it no no trains no airplanes no cars they walked they rode boats and donkeys, and there's wild animals attacking them. It's crazy, crazy, to gladiators. <clears throat> Irish proverb. Uh, I love these things. <laughs> if you come up in this life, make sure you don't go down in the next. You gotta have a pure heart. God's bringing us up in this life. We here in America, we're so blessed. We have such wonderful and great opportunities here. To, 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 to make a good living, to, to live in a beautiful house, to live in a beautiful island like this. The government's not like trying to kill us and throw us in jail like they were in Rome in the first century. We're so blessed. We're coming up in this life. But what happens when we come up in this life? We get a divided heart. We start idolizing other things. And we go down in the next. Don't let that be you. My challenge, give God all of your heart in prayer, in your time, in your finances. Pray that God will give you faith to do it. Point number three, unity is strength. Back in Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> the weather's bipolar today. It's like cold and breezy and rainy and muggy. Like back and forth all the way through. Acts chapter 15, verse 12. 
It's like my son when he has too much sugar. It's like, bam, and then. <laughs> Acts chapter 15 and verse 12. Continuing our reading here. This is kind of cool, right? So they're having a disagreement. They go to Jerusalem. They're getting some advice. And uh, the leader of the church here, James, is making a call. Makes a judgment call. He hears both sides of the story. This is what happens. <clears throat> Verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality and from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times as in read the synagogue on every Sabbath. <clears throat> so James here, who is the leader of the church, he, has, he listens to both sides of the disagreement and he makes a judgment call. What's the first thing he does? Goes to the scriptures, goes to the Bible to make his decision. Any wise and great leader is going to do that. That's where we, our standard is. It's not our opinions. It's not our feelings yes. that matter. What's powerful Amen. and impactful are the scriptures. So the decisions we make have the scriptures behind them. This, these yes. decisions hold weight. Yeah. Well, Amen. Yeah. He says, man, the, the gospel message has been spreading. The wonders of God are being known. It's in our lives. It's, it's incredible. All the things that's been happening here. You know, Paul's first missionary journey when he went along with Barnabas, was a round trip distance of 1,500 miles. It take about 53 days just to go straight through, but these guys took their time. It took them a year to go on a missionary journey. Now, James is the leader of the church. He listens to these things, right, that they've done on their missionary journey and how many people came to know God, and he's fired up about it. James is stoked, right? He said, God has been calling people from all walks of life. And he quotes the Old, the Old Testament about all people being called to God. And that's what I love about this church that we're in. As we look across, this is just one small part of our church, right? Yeah. Uh, here at Hilo, and we have the other house churches meeting right now. But around the world, there's so many different people. Even in this small room here with just a handful of us, how different we all are, different ethnicities and walks of life and backgrounds. I think it's so cool. And it really proves that God is the one putting this church together here and around the world. Yeah. It's amazing. I don't know about you guys, but I feel very uncomfortable standing up here and there's only white people in this audience. That'd be so weird to me. Nothing to say to you being white, Kaden. <laughs> Kaden's like, you're white too. What are you talking about? I just got a pen, you know? <laughs> But here's the thing, right? Hawaii is very diverse, right? And so our church is very diverse because Hawaii is very diverse and we reach out to everybody. We don't just reach out to only guys or only old people or only white people. We convert all people to Christianity. And that's how we know God and the Holy Spirit are behind what's happening in our church around here. Amen? It's incredible. So for all of us, we need to get chilled out and get unified because the reality because the reality is society is very polarized right now, right? Uh, so people love to group themselves in different political groups or different movements or, or different philosophies, right? You got anti-maskers, you got anti-vaxxers, and you got pro this and pro that and anti this. And that's not what our church is, though. Right. We don't get hung up on those things. We got to get unified yeah. in all areas of our life. And so they had this controversy here and it's causing a disunity. But James makes a judgment call. And he calls the church to believe it and to follow it and to get unified on it. Right? It's, it's a, there's always going to be a thin line that we need to walk 
whether we're a leader or whether we're a disciple, whatever we are, right? There's always going to be a thing. Jesus preached something very, very clear. Very clear. He said, it's a narrow road to heaven. It's a narrow road and it's a narrow way, a narrow gate, and only a few are going to find it. So the temptation that we are, are always going to fall into is to either make that road wider, to be more accepting, to be more inclusive, and to, to, to get, don't hurt anybody's feelings. We don't lose any friends over it. We make the, wide ro the road wider. Oh, Jesus loves you no matter what. It's okay. You don't have to repent. Uh, you know, you can live your life however you want. And, you can, and God will still accept you. And that's preaching a wide road to Christianity. Now, on the other hand, the pendulum can swing to the other side of the spectrum, right? And we have this narrow road. And maybe we see people are, are having, taking too much liberty, maybe having too much freedom. And we start to get legalistic. We make that narrow road even narrower. And that's a bad thing, too. And that's kind of what was happening in the church here. You can the, the religious background people wanting to make the road narrower and harder to become a Christian. You got to get circumcised. They're like, ah, I'm falling away today, you know? <laughs> and then, the, then you have these other people that apparently they had some sexual morality going on, stuff like that. And they're accepting sin within the fellowship. We can't do either. So he has to make some concessions here, James does. And he said, starts talking about, all right, let's do it with the sexual morality. That's bad. We all know that's bad, right, guys? No, no sex. You got to have sex inside of marriage. And other than that, no can do, right? Um, and then uh, they, they got this food sacrifice, the idols and the blood. And let's, let's, let's stay away from that stuff too, guys. He kind of makes a concession there, right? And so in our, in our church here, we have the, the differing opinions and the different viewpoints on the, the government and the pandemic and all those things. And so we got to wear these masks and we don't want to, like, I don't know if I want to wear a mask and offend someone or don't wear a mask and bum somebody out. But we as Christians, we got, hey, just do what's right. Accept each other. Be unified. Don't look down on the other person when they want to do something a different way than you. Amen. You guys hear me in the back of right? So I was like, no. <laughs> I'll bring the sound system out next time. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming in for a landing, guys. <laughs> Yes, zoom in. You guys can zoom in. <laughs> <We're the zoomers. laughs> yeah. All right, all right. I have a plan. We're going to have a building soon, okay? <laughs> Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. This is his prayer. This is his heart. This is his desire. He said that all the believers be brought to complete unity. This is what Jesus prayed for. And we have to be able to be willing to fight and die for our unity. We cannot let anything divide us, our hearts, or each other at all at any time. Jesus knew that the only way that we could conquer this lost world that's being held captive by the enemy is to be completely unified in all things. So my challenge for you is in your marriages, in your relationships, have unity, fight for it. If you have any kind of disunity, get rid of it and become unified. Because life is a battle. Life is tough. It's challenging. It's hard out there. There's a story uh, of 75 years ago. The United States Marine Corps was waging war against the Japanese forces on Tarawa Atoll. The Japanese admiral, his name was Kije Shibasaki. He was so confident that he would hold his position. They said it take 1 million men 100 years to conquer them. 18,000 United States Marines did it in 76 hours. But it wasn't without great sacrifice. They did it, but they suffered for it. It was painful. They, they had people die. A thousand men were killed and 2,000 were wounded. The Japanese had it way worse though. Thousands upon thousands of them died, including Admiral Shibasaki. At the at first light of the third day, there are only 17 men left alive to surrender in the Japanese forces. They had to go through hell on earth to take that atoll though. They got stuck at low tide on the reef. And for 500 yards, they had to wade through the water at low tide. 
while being shot at by the Japanese entrenched on the island. The United States Navy bombed the tarnations out of that place from the battleship. It blew the island to pieces. But these guys were dug down in tunnels, so it didn't kill much of them. So they had to fight from trench to trench, tunnel to tunnel, to completely wipe them out and annihilate them. Sometimes in life, you might feel stranded on the reef at low tide. <laughs> Can't go anywhere. Can't go right or left without stepping on a bana getting hurt, getting worked, worked by a wave, like you gotta get smashed, right? No matter what you do. Here we are on the big island, in the middle of nowhere, in a little church out here. Might feel stranded and stuck here, possibly. I don't know. You might be feeling that way. Trying to wade through life, just survive it. Your family persecuting your boss, giving you a hard time. You can't go anywhere, can't do anything without getting hurt, right? Sometimes it might feel like our church in LA is asking for too much. I mean, maybe they want to take some more people to train them for leadership, right? Maybe they want to take some more special missions money, and it's getting challenging. And you feel like they're like the Navy out there bombing stuff, but not really helping that much. You might feel that way at some time, right? But we are here. We are the front line troops in this army. We're at the tip of the spear, the edge of the sword. That's who we are. What are we good for? We're good for fighting and we're good for dying. That's what we're good for. We are fighting for our worldwide brothers and sisters all over the world. Yeah. We are fighting for our church in LA. Yeah. We are fighting for our church in Honolulu and our church in Kona. We're fighting for them. We're fighting for the brothers and sisters right next to us today. And we're fighting for Jesus. And by God, we're never going to quit. We're never going to quit and we're always going to win because we have Jesus on our side and we have a church that is strengthened by God. We are strong enough to know that we don't know it all and we need to get advice and we need to get help from each other. We are strong because we have faith and God has given us a pure heart. We are strong because we're unified to each other and to the scriptures and to Jesus Christ. We live in a fallen world, brothers and sisters. They're wandering around aimlessly like sheep without a shepherd. When we fight for unity with each other, we will be strong and we will make a difference. And I close it out with a Irish blessing. You guessed it. <laughs> May love and laughter light your days and warm your heart and home. May good and faithful friends be yours wherever you may roam. May peace and plenty bless your world with joy that long endures. May all life's passing seasons bring the best to you and yours. I love you guys all. Stay strong. All the way.